Welcome everyone to Array Global's monthly workshop. I'll turn the time over to Dr. Ray to give us an introduction. Hello everyone, uh, this is Dr. Ray Lindley, Executive Director for Array Global, and uh, we're excited to uh, do something today that we've never done before. And we really turned this uh, uh, workshop over to you so that uh, we can try to address some questions that or situations which maybe you have questions about and would like to know more about and that's how we're uh, doing it today. I'm really excited of course you all know Dr. Uh, Jake Frankham uh, and also on with us today is Dr. Salam Noor. Uh, the three of us are the founding board of Array Global and even though you don't see Dr. Salam as often as you see Dr. Jake and myself he's definitely part of, of everything that we do and and uh, it gives tremendous contributions. We were talking a little bit ago, among the three of us, uh, we have over 110 years of experience as educators. And uh, maybe, that's, uh, maybe that says something about our age, but uh, we, we want you to know that for 110 years accumulated among the three of us, we've all, uh, we've all been in the field of education. So it's great to be with you today, and we'll uh, introduce Dr. Jake and then Dr. Salam, and uh, then we'll go ahead with the questions you have throughout the course of this. Uh, if we say something that you would like to uh, add a different uh, uh, part of the question to, or if something explained a little bit more, be sure to raise your hand, and we'll try to get to you as soon as we can. Dr. Jake, you have a few things for us. Yeah, looks like we have people coming in uh, still from the waiting room. And so we're excited to have everyone here from all over the world. Uh, I wanted to first start off by sharing my screen because we have some exciting news. We have a lot of people, thousands of people who follow our Facebook page. And you have probably seen our great announcements this past week for those students who won uh, our Stella Science Fair. It's a very exciting time. We're grateful for all the students and schools that participated. And we welcome all the schools and anyone throughout the world to participate in these awesome uh, academic contests that we have. We have one in the fall, in the winter, and the summer. Um, we have an art contest, a writing contest, um, and we have the science fair. The science fair gets very popular, but we uh, give a co big congratulations to uh, Akamad from the Future Vision Private School. And you can go through our, our Facebook page and see the other winners that took first, second, and third places in these different areas. Also, I would encourage you to get on and look at our, our newsletter. Our newsletter is sent out every uh, month. It's sent out just right before our workshop. This one was sent out on Tuesday the 16th. If you're not signed up for the newsletter, please put something in the chat or you can email us at info at ArrayGlobal. Dot org. It'll talk about our workshops. It'll talk about you know some of the hot topics, the main topics that are going on in education, and it will remind you um, about some of the upcoming events that we have. So make sure that you uh, subscribe to our newsletter. There's a lot of good information, and we'd love to uh, get that information out to you. And then also just a reminder of the services that we provide. I know it's it's May and you're winding down the school year and, and you're ready to almost have your summer start, but not yet. You still have a few more weeks left, many of you, but make sure you get in there and you see the services that we provide. We provide support throughout the summertime. Obviously our main service that we provide is accreditation services, but accreditation services is just one of the main components that we provide for your school improvement efforts. We provide certification. You can get certified in your uh, specific programs that you offer in your school. During the summertime, if you need some help, we offer consulting services or professional development services, and we can tailor those to the needs that you have in your school. So again, please get into these, look at these services that we can provide and reach out and talk to us, and we'd be happy to help and support you. As always, at the end of the workshop, when, after Dr. Ray gives his words of wisdom, we will post in the chat the, uh, the survey that you need to fill out in order to get your certificate. So make sure that you please do that. Also, I will post um, in the chat uh, the way that you can join our Array Global Educators Association. This is a closed Facebook group that you can put questions in at any time. 
and you'll have people from all over the world. You'll have Array Global Administration that can answer those questions and guide you in your school improvement uh, efforts. So again, please get in and look at the services that we provide. We are here to help and support you. And uh, we, we wanna see every school, every school succeed and especially every student be successful. So Dr. Ray, back to you. Good, thank you, Dr. Jake. And uh, I want to uh, have Dr. Salam give a few words of greeting before we get into our uh, workshop today. Dr. Salam. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lindley, Dr. Jake. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And I'm just thrilled to be a part of this workshop today. And uh, I'm really excited to see the wide range of services that Array Global provides. And these, these workshops have been really instrumental in keeping people informed, engaged, and for us also to learn about what's needed in the field. So I'm delighted to be here and looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you. Great. So we're going to get into the workshop now. Uh, we have received about 140 or so comments or questions, and we're going to try to, to generalize some of these uh, some of these questions and responses into some general categories. And the three of us have talked about these, and we each will try to jump in and give some information. As I said earlier, if you have any questions or comments, uh, we ask you to keep your comments and your questions short because we have a pretty full agenda, but this is what we're doing today. One of the things that we talked about last uh, workshop was this whole idea of uh, internet and we got into the area of, uh, of learning and what we're learning from the, uh, from the computer and how we're having to deal with the fact that students have so much more access to so much information. And uh, Dr. Salam is going to start off by talking a little bit uh, about the whole, uh, whole concept of uh, learning by the computer, learning the things we can on computer, and uh, might generate some questions on your part. So we'll try to go through these as, uh, as we get to them. So Dr. Salam, the show is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lindley. So I'm going to be really brief and more than anything, just try to frame our conversation today and give you some things to think about, because quite frankly, I am not an expert on artificial intelligence. I am not an expert on chat GPT. But the one thing I will say to you is do not be afraid, because I was with a school district yesterday. It's one of the large school districts in the state that I work in. And I asked them, I said, what are you doing about AI? And they said, nothing, because they have, they're so behind the curve, they haven't really figured out what to do with it. But the school district has a system, and this system has policies that deal with how to access technology, how to use technology, how to guide students in the use of technology. So if I want us to step back a little bit, and as I look at the people on, uh, that are joining us today, uh, as Dr. Ray said, between the three of us, we, we have uh, over 100 years of experience in education. That means we've been around a long time. And uh, some of us remember when the computer became a tool and we were really concerned. And if you want to go back 100 years, oops, sorry about that. Um, too many computers around me. Um, and if you want to go back uh, 100 years, I read an article the other day because I'm trying to become a bit more informed and educated on uh, these new technologies and these tools. And I want to underscore is that they are tools. I mean, 100 years ago, the pencil was a threat to the school system. Then the calculator became a big threat to the school system. Are students going to cheat? Are they not going to be able to, compu to compute and, and do analytical thinking and interpretation? And then we had the great world, 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 world wide web, the internet. The internet was a really big scare. Because when we used to do research, we all walked to the library, drove to the library, took a bus to the library, and that's where we accessed information. The internet made that information very accessible and very readily available to us. And quite frankly, we had to teach students how to access that information, how to responsibly and ethically do their research, how to organize that information so it is representative of their thoughts and their voice and their perspective. So when I think about Chad GPT, I want to encourage you to think about it in a couple of ways. One is, yes, it does trigger a lot of fear in us. Are students going to be cheating? 
Are they going to uh, you know, abuse that information? And are they going to try and uh, represent it in a way that's really not accurate or authentic as their own work? And all of that is probably true, but I would say that actually happens today. That's happened in our system for a long, long time and will probably continue to happen. So the key to it, in my opinion, is to think about Chad GPT um, as a tool that you are going to use as a teacher, rather than a tool that is, as a, that is a threat to you. All of the technology that we've had up to this point has not replaced teachers. That is the biggest fear that I get from teachers and from educators. Is Chad GPT and artificial intelligence going to replace teachers? The answer is absolutely no. Absolutely not. In fact, as we advance into AI, teachers become even more important and more pertinent to the learning process that we guide students through. Because a big part of artificial intelligence is helping students understand the moral, ethical, societal, cultural, political implications of this tool. So our responsibility is to teach students the ethical standards that go along with this. I think when we, when I think about some of the articles and the research that I've done on artificial intelligence is that it's really not different from a search engine. So a search engine today pulls a lot of information for you. Chad GPT, for example, takes it a step further and creates the document, the narrative, the story, the assignment, so the question is, how do we teach students to ethically and responsibly use this system? And that's one of the articles that I read describes it as a system. So Google uh, and all of these other search engines that we've used, they just pull information for you. ChatGPT is a system that allows this information to be integrated and to be formed into concrete and solid ideas and concepts and narratives, if you will. So I think for me, as, as somebody that is currently teaching at the university level, I feel that I have to create some, some rules. Uh, the institution that I teach in, whether it's a, is a K-12 institution or a university institution, has to establish some policies. And the policies are not necessarily to prevent, to prevent students from cheating, from plagiarism. I think we have policies that deal with plagiarism. But how do we incorporate now AI into that? So the question is, um, what do I need to do as a classroom teacher to help students understand this new tool, to help them use it in an ethical and moral manner? How do I help them understand the importance of developing their own skills of reading, writing, critical thinking, analysis, mathematical interpretations, et cetera, and how this tool could actually validate that for them and not necessarily do it for them. So I think it's really important to look at it as a way to reframe and rethink our teaching, just like we have with the internet and other tools that became available to us over the years. And frankly, as teachers, I would really encourage you to think about how could this help you? Could this AI framework help you differentiate instruction? Could it help you differentiate lesson plans if you have 30 or 40 kids in your classroom and then there is a small subset of students that need something different? Could AI, could Chad GPT actually become a tool for you to enhance the learning for these students? Could it become a tool for you to enhance your own teaching and your own instruction? Um, I've read about school districts that are using AI as an instructional coach. They don't have the means for an instructional coach uh, in their school. They can't even afford one. So they're using AI in, in this way. The teacher records themselves teaching. Then they upload it to Chad GPT and they ask AI, artificial intelligence, they ask that tool to analyze their teaching based on an established set of standards. And they're getting enormous feedback. They're getting really good feedback. You can use AI to give you feedback on your students' work. Some districts are thinking about using it for professional development to differentiate professional development for different teachers, groups, subjects, et cetera. Because some of the schools that I work with have 150 teachers and when they do professional development, 
It's really for everyone. So what if we thought about using G GP, chat GPT, for example, to customize professional development, to find videos, instructional videos and tools that teachers can select from. So I think there are some, some serious implications associated with, with um, uh, AI, but I think we need to think more proactively about how do we get in front of it? So we're not necessarily reacting to it. What policies do we need to put in place? How do we modify our instructions? How do we modify our engagement with students? Uh, I'm a big fan of personalized learning and formative assessments. Um, can we use chat GPT to enhance personalized learning for students? You know, can it customize lessons and, and applications for individual students or groups of students in my classrooms, for example? How do I use it for developing formal, you know, for uh, formative assessments and application-based assessments that I can use with multiple students in my classroom or student groups? So I just think we have to, uh, as educators, we have to get really excited about it and uh, figure out how do we use it? How do we leverage it? How do we outsmart it? I know it's, it's presented to us as the smartest, most brilliant thing in the world. Um, I've been reading an article. Uh, it's actually published by uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And uh, this gentleman talks about, he, in his reference to AI, he says, AI has been around for a long, long time. We may not realize it. We actually have been using it and it's been part of our life for a long time. But now the tool has been enhanced so much that it's doing things that typically humans did. So, but nonetheless, humans designed it. So he said, instead of just thinking about AI as a threat, he said, what if we, you know, AI stands for artificial intelligence. He says, what if we approached it from an intelligence augmentation? So AI is a tool and people have intelligence. What if we augmented our own intelligence, in, the, in essence, enhance and increase and support and complement your students' intelligence and our system's intelligence to use it in a more positive and constructive way. So if I were teaching on day one, I would talk about artificial intelligence and chat GPT with my students. And I would talk to them about how they can use it and how they can use it appropriately and misuse it inappropriately and how we're going to evaluate their work because ultimately the students are yours and you know their proficiency level. So if a student's proficiency level is sort of in the middle of the range, but then all of a sudden they produce an assignment or a paper that just exceeds way beyond your expectations of them. I think, you know, if I were approaching this, I would say, Instead of just punishing them and say you're cheating, I would use it as a learning opportunity and to help them understand that, you know, they're smart enough to manipulate this and take advantage of it, but what have they really learned? So I think it's an opportunity to shift the focus in our classrooms on learning. What are we learning? These are tools. I can have Ch a chat GPT produce the most wonderful essay, but have I learned anything? Because ultimately we have to face the truth. We have to face the reality. And they're not going to be able to get away with it forever. So I just think, think about ethics, think about responsibility, think about the values that we instill in students in terms of how to approach things and how to use things. And I will close by saying, don't be afraid, be excited. Actually, be really excited and think about how you're going to use it, not just your students, how you're going to use it to make your life better, to make your teaching easier and better. Sorry, uh, Dr. Ray and Dr. Jake, I took too long, but- Oh, no, it's good. No, Thank no, it, that was really good. There's one question, Salam, Dr. Salama, uh, yes. that came in from Farouz. Uh, how credible do you think the feedback is from, from AI, from ChatGPT and these other AI platforms? Um, thank you for the question. And I'm really glad you asked it because um, I think it is fairly credible. These sources have been tested and have been, um, 
they've, they've done a lot of validity studies. I mean, this is not a new product that just came on the market. It's been, it's been tested and retested and retested and verified. So the credibility is very high. However, there are still gaps and that's really what you have to watch for. So Chad GPT does not always give you correct sources from where they got that information. Sometimes they actually don't provide the actual sources from which they, from where they got that information. And sometimes the information is inaccurate. So I think actually this could be a good exercise to do with students where you help them see how good this tool is, but it also has some shortcomings because ultimately we have to use our brain, we have to use our intellect, we have to use our skills to verify information. So that's a really good question. And I think it would be a good discussion with, uh, with students. Thank you. Yeah, and one thing that I've seen in my school district is just the, the tools that can be used as a teacher uh, from ChatGPT, where you can say, hey, write me a lesson plan on how to teach Newton's three laws of motion. And it will come up with this. And it doesn't mean that you have to do it, but at least it gives you some ideas and some thoughts. I've also had teachers use it to write letters to parents, just a form letter about, hey, we're going on a field trip this day. Um, and then it pops it right out. And so it's there to uh, help you maximize your time, be more efficient. Um, I've used it to research on how to deal with a situation. How is best mm -hmm. to deal with this student or this parent? Um, what are some ideas? So it's, it's yeah. a very, very strong, strong uh, search engine. I think that's what mainly yeah. it's yeah. getting to. If I may add to that, just one thing really quickly. Sure. I appreciate you sharing these examples, Dr. Jake. Think about it as an assistant. Yeah. Think yeah. about yeah. all of the things that you have to do as a school teacher, as an administrator. And think about, you know, you can make a list and say, if I had an assistant, what could this assistant help me with? And make a list. And then Chad GPT might be able to help you with those things. Sorry, Dr. Ray, I think you wanted to jump in. Well, that's okay. I just wanted to emphasize two points that you said. Number one is we have to be aware of AI, artificial intelligence. Your students are well aware of it, I promise you. Yes. And this summer will be a good time for you to find out as much about it. And as, as Dr. Salam said, use it as a good learning tool. You'll be surprised what you can find. Uh, uh, Dr. Jake just mentioned, if I help me prepare a lesson on, and, and you'll get some great ideas. And the second thing, and it really is a strong one, is don't forget you as a teacher will have more influence on your students' lives than the information they get either from your lessons or from chat B GPT. That's a bucket of information, but the real learning happens in interpersonal communications. We definitely learned that during COVID, schools being shut down. So let's 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 go ahead. Uh, there was a question about, uh, I think a couple of questions that we got regarding parent involvement in uh, in uh, your classroom, in your uh, students' education and their children's education. And uh, just, just a, two or three suggestions that I'll give, and then maybe uh, uh, my other two guys will jump in too. But one of the most important things is that when you get a request from a parent, be prompt in your answer. Be very prompt in your answer and try to schedule them to come to you. If they have a question about something that's going on in class, invite the parent to come to meet with you, to talk with you, and be sure to give positive feedback. Some And another question, we're talking about student discipline, but there's positive and negative feedback. But even the positive feedback is a learning opportunity for parents. And so uh, the general idea of parent involvement Remember that communication with parents is key, is a big key. Don't be afraid of parents because it's a big key to helping their children learn your students. So it's a big key. Uh, other guys, what yeah, are you? I, yeah, I wanted to add to that a little bit, Dr. Ray, because sometimes I think we like to contact parents about every little thing, that this student did this. And sometimes we need to just let students be students 
And we don't need to contact parents for every single little thing that happens because that could actually wear, wear down trust that we have with students, wear down trust that we have with the parents. Um, but I think we need to make sure that we're, that we're in regular communication about things that are going to help the, the students grow and develop and help maintain that trust that the school has with the parents. Yeah. The, the only thing that I would add, if I may, is that we always, it's really important to think about parents as partners with us in this work. They're co-teachers. Yes, some of them don't have the skills and the knowledge and the experience, but um, when they reach out to us, uh, even here in, in some of the schools and districts that I work in, there is a sense of fear and trepidation. What does this parent want? Uh, I think no matter the circumstance, as Dr. Ray said, it's important to be responsive. It's important to engage, um, treat them as a partner. And I think the one thing that we always advise teachers here, if you're gonna make a call to a parent about a problem at school or an incident, always start with something positive. Mm -hmm. So no matter how bad it is, uh, always say something positive about the student and, um, and, and use that to kind of lead you to the challenge that you're facing and how the parent is gonna help you with that challenge. I think it's important to enlist parents as allies and, and as helpers to what we're facing. And if you need some ideas, you can get onto ChatGPT and ask and there you see go. if there are some positive things that you could write, you could say before uh, you get into the issues that you have. Yeah. Yes, and 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 remember too that that uh, ultimately parents and teachers probably want the same thing for the students, and they want them to be successful in in what they do. So start with that. Start with that, and just. One small caution I would make, respect your own time. Uh, I, would, I would suggest that uh, you, if, if possible, that you try to be careful about using your personal time. If a parent shouldn't be able to call you at midnight and, and say, hey, you know, I wanna know about this and that. So respect your personal time in, in talking with and dealing with parents. Well, Dr. Ray, we have some questions in the chat if we want to go back to uh, uh, artificial intelligence and chat GPT, if you're okay with that. Well, we can. Let's let's save that to the end. Okay. Dr. Yeah. Is, if, if we don't, we could make this a whole hour of chat GPT, <laughs> and uh, we have so many more questions. So if we could save those sure, sure. questions until the end. Uh, there was a question, uh, m more than one question, about uh, dealing with student behavior. Uh, when I was uh, when I was working on my doctorate, uh, I I had to take a series of courses in uh, in uh, psychological development, and uh, we had to take what we used to call the uh, intelligence test. You know, your IQ is so and so and so and so, and and one of the questions on on that test that you would you could take or and these are passe now. We don't really use them anymore. But uh, one of the questions on the test was, in what way are praise and punishment alike? What way are praise and punishment alike? Now, the average thinker might think, oh, wait a minute. No, 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 they're opposites. You either praise somebody or you punish something. But the real answer is they are both forms of discipline. Praising somebody for the work that he or she has done is a form of discipline because all of you, I'm sure, if any of the three of us came into your classroom to do a teacher evaluation, which sometimes is a dreaded thing, and, uh, and we said, hey, Farouz, I want you to know that I saw this and this and this, that I really think you did a great job. Now, if you do have something to suggest, imagine how much better you would feel after after you have said. So think about, first of all, that discipline not only includes dealing with something negative, but it's dealing a lot with something positive. And sometimes if you reinforce the positive, the negative on discipline will be much less. Okay, guys, I exploded. I know. I, I, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Salam. Uh, what I was going to say, I think what I'm curious about actually is if 
if you're experiencing student behavior issues this year, let's say more than you have uh, prior to COVID, the pandemic, because that is a problem that we are seeing here in the United States and in Oregon where I live more specifically, where behavior uh, is, you know, it, it's, it has multiplied, first of all, and it's very different in terms of the, the age appropriateness, if you will. I was talking to a principal the other day and he shared with me that their juniors, their 11th graders in high school, are behaving like seventh and eighth graders in some ways. They're smart, they're intelligent. Yes, there is a learning gap as a result of the pandemic, but the behavior that they're exhibiting that's causing problems for them and for the school and it's becoming disruptive is that of a typical seventh grader or an eighth grader. So we started talking about that and we said, you know, a lot of these kids were not in school during seventh and eighth grade or even eighth or ninth grade. So the socialization that typically happens in school did not happen. So in our schools, we're starting to look at behavior very closely. We're also starting to look at mental health because students were in isolation for so long. We feel that there are some mental health issues that we need to pay attention to. And they're not extreme per se, but nonetheless, the isolation contributed to that. And when kids are in school today, they're having a hard time regulating and they're having a hard time managing themselves. So to build on what Dr. Ray said, I really think it's important sometimes to just step back. And I would say, not just as a teacher, but as a group of teachers in a school, it would be interesting if you all had a conversation about what you're observing and what may be contributing to the behavior. And what we noticed in some of our schools, it's a small subset of the student population. It's not all of the ninth graders or 10th graders. So we try to look at that, look at that from an analytical point of view and to try and understand what is really contributing to the misbehavior or the behavioral issues that we're facing. And I think as Dr. Ray said, you know, I mean, the consequences and the rewards are a big part of that, you know, we started to think about putting systems in the schools to try and curb this behavior. One of the things that we tried to do is have students also be responsible for the conduct that they want to have in their school. So it's not just the administrators or the teachers, we've tried to actually promote leadership in students where the students are talking to other students and saying, you know, it's not appropriate for you to go into a bathroom and just destroy it and it's not appropriate for you to damage property. So it's, it's, it's an interesting dilemma that we are facing today because typically when we have behavior issues, we almost wanna to go to consequences and discipline. And I think that's really important, but can we step back and think about what's contributing to it? And are there other ways to get students to think about what they're doing and why they're doing it? I like that. In my schools, what we've had to do is we've had to kind of re-socialize some of our students because we were fortunate enough to be able to have our students throughout the pandemic for, you know, for the most part, except that first, that first part of that spring. But when they did come back, they were all separated. They were in little tiny cohorts, little tiny pods, and they didn't get to interact with others as much as they normally would. So what we've had to do mm -hmm. is do a lot more um, social building activities, some more act, uh, activities that get students around talking and communicating with one another um, and turning off their, their technology and getting them to talk face to face because everyone got so much more connected. They were already very connected before the pandemic, but now uh, during the pandemic, it was so much more intense because uh, that's how we were, you were connecting with people socially. So we've had to say, hey, turn off the cell phones. Let's put those away. Let's uh, get out and let's do some service projects together. Let's do some project-based learning, some cooperative learning activities, and just help them talk and get together a little bit more. So that's that's been a great part of that too. And then I think it's really important that early on in the year or the semester, when you have just new students coming to you for the first time, make sure that, and I, I suggest that you post on the wall right in front of the class, expected student behavior in this class. And we talked last month about 
those those kinds of things. If you if you have a question, here's what you do. If you need to go to the bathroom, here's what you do. Or uh, uh, please only talk with your neighbor when we have a group discussion and so forth. And if you have eight, nine, ten of these things listed that that are listed in a positive way, then and you you practice these at the beginning of the year, then when a student's behavior becomes something that is not acceptable to you, uh, you've got number three to refer to. And rather than calling out the student in front of the class and embarrassing that student, uh, go just gently and whisper to the student, hey, look at number three up there where it says, please raise your hand if you wanna ask a question. We've kind of established that in this workshop. For instance, if you have a question or a comment, we ask you to put it in the chat room. If you want to ask a question, we ask you to raise your hand. Well, that's expected, but you know, uh, we've, we've been around a few times and we might understand that better than students uh, are expected. And, and the other thing I would suggest is if you've got a difficult student who, no matter what you do, this student seems to try your patience and so forth. Find a time to be a, have a very positive conversation with that student, just the two of you, just showing an interest in the student who is his behavior or her behavior is something that's not acceptable to you. Have a conversation. Don't make it about behavior. Just make it about something. Hey, I noticed that... Uh, Yesterday was your birthday. Did you have a good time? Did you have a party? And and just conversation among the uh, between the two of you. So those kinds of things will all help in student behavior. And we know that there are sometimes the behavior becomes out of bounds. It's something that we have to deal with. But as much as possible, use positive reinforcement and develop that in your lesson plans, activities, group instruction. Group work will help in the behavior of students also. So Dr. Ray, are you saying, are you saying that the traditional methods that we've been uh, hammering away for, for a century are still applicable? Oh my, give me one of those traditional methods. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're still the same things that we've, we've been promoting for years and years and years. Uh, have, have procedures, have relationships, and that's what we need to keep, keep focusing on. Yeah, and, and I think I, the key, if I, what I, when Dr. Ray was speaking, this is what it's really triggered for me as a reminder, and that is the relationship piece. I think it's really important to cultivate relationships with our students, um, whether we like them or not. I think we have to have relationships with them that allow us to, um, to be tough on them when we need to be tough on them and to be kind to them even when they make mistakes. So I think the relationship is really, really important. And we also know the importance of the relationship to learning. Um, you know, I mean, you, you know the phrase that uh, your students don't care how much you know until they're not gonna care how much you know until they care, until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. So they want you to care about them. They want that relationship. And I think that also allows them to grow, to expect you to hold them accountable. And, and to hold them responsible for, uh, for things, for their behavior when, when it's not what you expect. Can't emphasize enough positive relationships. Yeah. The most difficult students sometime, you need to ask that student to present something to the class. Hey, you did a really nice job on your paper. Would you be willing to share this with the class or whatever? Those positive making you feel important. We usually have a couple of hundred people in these workshops. And uh, unless you ask a question, uh, we don't have a chance to individualize things with you, but hope everybody feels, yes, I'm important. I'm an important part of this learning activity and my opinion is valued. So yeah, uh, I, I loved that we got some questions on, on student discipline, student behavior. And remember discipline is both positive and negative. Okay, I uh, want to go on to another question now. Uh, there was a question about how you deal with students who appear to have a very short memory span. They don't, uh, they don't seem to retain information uh, more than, you know, just the immediate past. Uh, uh, Dr. Salam, Dr. Jake, you want to stop and start this off? I, Jake, would you like me to jump in? Yep, yep. yep. 
So uh, I think that is really a great question. And I would, I would uh, to play teacher here, I would paraphrase it and turn it back to you. And I would ask you, why isn't the student or why aren't these students retaining the information or the learning that you shared with them? And for me, if I were to answer that, I would say it's not an issue of memory or memorization, unless I'm expecting them to memorize something and then they didn't do the work. That, if that, that was the homework, you have to memorize this poem or you have to memorize this equation or this formula or whatever. Um, then it's not an issue of memory, it's an issue of have they done the work? Have we taught them how to memorize, if you will? But I wanna take it back to the question that I asked you, why do you think they're not retaining information? And for me, it always comes back to engagement. And it always comes back to that relationship piece that we were talking about earlier. And it comes back to me, the teacher, learning as much as I possibly know, uh, as much as I possibly can about every student in my classroom. So I need to get to know my students. I need to know their strengths, their weaknesses. I need to understand how they learn because some students are auditory learners. I'm the kind of person, if I'm sitting in a lecture, all I have to do is just hear it. I have four kids, uh, one of them, has to do it by his hands. He has to see it applied. He has to see it in context. He has to have a relationship with the concepts and the principles and the ideas that we're trying that you want him to learn. So I think a lot of it is, is engagement. Are we engaging students to the point that the learning is personal to them? The learning is exciting, it's meaningful, it's relevant, it's useful. Because it may be for half of your class, but the other half, we have to find new and different ways for engaging them. So I think diversifying our lessons, diversifying how we uh, convey information, uh, providing opportunities for hands-on, letting students actually ask questions, let them learn in groups, learn together, learn from each other. I just think it's a really, it, I think it's a different question in my mind that we should be asking, and we should be asking ourselves that. Why aren't students learning? Why are they not retaining this wonderful lecture and information that I just gave them? <laughs> I have so much to offer. Exactly. Why didn't, why didn't you learn it? Exactly. So it's not, it's not why didn't you learn it? Uh, it's what do I need to do and differently so you could learn it? Uh, Dr. Jake, sorry, I jumped in yeah. front of you again. Yeah, I think I think it just goes back. To, I think Dr. Ray said this number of times. We're no longer the sage on the stage, uh, meaning we're not the old person up on the state in the front of the classroom and just departing that information. We're not opening up our students' heads and just and just putting that gray matter in there. Uh, we have to engage them. We have to get them excited about learning. Um, I, I remember as I'm a science teacher. I was a science teacher in high school. And science for, for me was wonderful to teach because you could always do something hands-on and we always did something hands-on every single day. And one of the biggest compliments that I had was a student who skipped most of the school day and he came in after lunch and he said, well, I came in just for your class because I knew we were going to do something fun. We were going to do something hands-on and they were having fun but they were learning at the same time. And I don't even know if they knew that they were learning because it was all these different activities that they could do, they could apply to their lives. Um, and that's also key, making it hands-on, making it fun and, and making it so it was applicable to what they were doing in their lives. And kind of Dr. Salam kind of got into this a little bit ago and I just, I wanna emphasize this when he talked about, look at yourself and see what are you doing. My prediction is, if you think that the way to teach is to stand in front of the class or sit at your desk and tell them all the information that you think they need to know and then give them a test the next day to see if they listen to you, 
you're not connecting with students and you will continue to have discipline problems because they're going to act out because we don't learn that way. None of us learn that way. Yes, we can get the information. As we said earlier, with AI, they can get all this information that you're going to teach. And my guess is, Dr. Jake, even though I'm not a scientist, yeah. my guess is everything that you taught in science, they could find out for themselves just by going on the internet. And yeah, so- I think with that too, Dr. A, I don't know how anyone could teach that way. I mean, I've seen teachers teach that way and they just seem so miserable. They seem so <laughs> unhappy and, and because they know that they could be doing better. And when we think of the greatest teachers who ever lived, they were the ones who were engaging. They were the ones that got the students thinking and excited. And most importantly, like uh, both Dr. Ray and Dr. Salam have talked about, they had relationships with those students. Those are, that's foundational to any student's success. Uh, maybe everything that we're talking about today, let's start with the R word, yeah. relationships. Really, that's the key. Yeah. So there's one other big, unless uh, either of you have something to say, there's one other big topic that uh, was addressed in the questions. I will add one thing to the big R and, and uh, Peruse and the- the, 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 yeah, R, the, the R is not for Ray, okay? <laughs> right. Well, yes, but <laughs> it is for me. <laughs> um, you know, Peruse talked about engagement, enthusiasm, and encouragement in the chat. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Willard Daggett. Willard Daggett is a, is a scholar in education, a researcher, has done a lot of work on educational improvement and school improvement and reform and early on in the 1980s up to now. He talked about the three R's. And the three R's are rigor, relevance, and relationships. So rigor is the quality of the instruction, the expectations that you have for students. The relevance is, is it meaningful to your students? Does it help them um, you know, make it applicable, I guess? It's the application. And the relationship is what we were just talking about. That's the, the big R, relationships, relationships, relationships. Yep, yep. Well, the final topic that we want to address today that came up in your questions, and then we'll open it up for questions and comments from you all. And that's the idea, uh, that's the whole concept of career planning. When do you do career planning? When, uh, when is it appropriate? What do you do at what time? And my first response to that is career planning should start the second you see your students, whether it's at the key KG uh, area or it's in grade 10, grade 11 and 12, when they're thinking of university or going into some trade or profession, find out what the students' interests are. We used to joke uh, here in the United States long time ago, we don't so much anymore. But if you asked uh, most first grade boys, what do you want to be when they grow up? They'd say, I want to be a football player. And if you ask most girls, this is a long time ago, what do you want to be when you grow? I want to be Miss America. I want to walk down that runway and have everybody notice how beautiful I am. That's, that's okay at that age. That's say, well, if you want to be a football player, what do you think it takes? And have them start thinking about that. The chances of them being a professional football player and signing contracts worth millions of dollars are probably pretty slim, but it's okay to dream. So early on, and, and what you do by this is you can help students say, okay, let me give you a story here, or why don't you read this about a football player or this uh, one gal who won a beauty pageant and how she got there and how much work that it was to, to get in there. And then have them start to set goals because one of the things early on, and we, we, we think that career planning is something, well, you know, grade 11, I better be thinking about what I'm gonna do after I graduate or after I'm graduated. No, that's way too late encourage them to think early and to start creating goals that they can work towards. They might find, I think I shared this once before, I was in a high school class, uh, Dr. Salam in, in the state of Oregon, and uh, they had sent the students out on, a, on an exploratory visit. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, places where they thought they might be interested in that as a career. Well, this one girl thought she wanted to be a nurse. And I was there the day that she reported on her field experience. And she says, whoa, I don't wanna be a nurse. They have to deal with blood, and I don't like the sight of blood. Well, hey, that's great information to, to deal with, but encourage them to seek out what that is and give them some kind of a, 
have an idea about setting goals for those. And I, and I think it's important to let students start thinking about that when they're young. There's no point waiting until they're in ninth grade. Have them start talking about it, even if they do all want to be football players uh, or whatever, but have them start thinking about what next steps are, what, what contributions they want to provide to their society, to their community, because ultimately that's what's most important is how are they going to help and support other people and their own community and their country and strengthen the world too. Um, and so have them start thinking about it, talk to them about it, have them research about it uh, at an early age, have their parents engage in that mm -hmm. process too. Yeah, and mentioning parents, we know that sometimes parents will have different expectations for their sons and daughters than the sons and daughters. We have to deal with that. We have to deal with the fact that uh, parents, uh, you know, my my son is going to be a medical doctor. My daughter is going to be an engineer. And that's why it's important for them to ask questions and do some research. And, and remember also, no matter what it is they're going to do in their career, they're going to have to have soft skills, what we call soft skills. And it's helping them understand those soft skills, how, how we interact with other people, how we respond when we're asked a question. And those, those are soft skills and the kindness that we show will really be important. I think the hard part is that there's so many jobs I mean, there's there that, that students don't even know about and and the marketplace is changing so much with new jobs and new professions that are coming up all the time to say nothing of how chat GPT is going to affect it. But students need to just start thinking about what they are interested in and then time will change and, and they'll they'll uh, find their their lane and they'll find their avenue that that is interesting to them. Yeah, if I may add to that, I think I think the key is. When you talk about career education, if you will, it has to be age appropriate. So uh, if I have a, a, a seven year old and I want them to be a, an astronaut and all you're talking to them about is, um, you know, let's say marketing or uh, foods or whatever, you know, as a parent, I may be upset because I may say, you know, you're steering my child in a different direction than I have aspirations for them. So as Dr. Ray said, we have to actually enlist parents as partners and we have to be sensitive to this aspect of parenting and what we aspire for our kids. However, I think age appropriate exposure and instruction becomes really, really important because you want the student to understand what you're trying to do. So I think early on, it's really about exposure. Uh, exposure to the world of work, the world, the idea of careers. And I think it's helping them understand the importance of education to actually achieving their hopes and dreams and goals. So it's important to think about it in terms of skills. So what are the skills that an elementary student needs to have relative to a career, the idea of careers? And then in middle school, you get a little bit more advanced where you can actually start to do exploration. Maybe they, and there are lots of tools, there are lots of systems, softwares that could help you with that as well, uh, where they do an interest inventory. Uh, they start thinking about people that they admire, jobs that they're interested in or career pathways. And, and then when you get into the high school stage, the, you know, the higher secondary stage, it's really about trying things out if that is applicable and appropriate. So I just think uh, building on what was just shared, it's really important to think about the skills. Uh, Dr. Ray talked about the soft skills. Um, some schools call them professional skills, you know, um, how, to, how to communicate, how to problem solve, how to relate to others, um, how to approach uh, challenges, uh, how to set goals, how to prioritize, how to use time, all of those things. So I just think the age appropriateness piece and what you do relative to career education is something that we have to really think clearly about. Yeah, and one thing that I've seen to add along with that, speaking of high schools, 
is an apprentice program, or we have in our school district a school to work program. So a student for one period or two periods will actually leave campus, go and work in that different area or shadow that employer and see what what if they're if they are interested in it, just like Dr. Ray said, someone who wants to be a nurse might go and hang out at the hospital and realize, nope, that's not for me. Um, but there are a lot of different ways that we can expose students and get them thinking about what they feel like is going to be their uh, yeah. interest. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess uh, I, one, one caution I would give is that uh, we know that we have to deal with, as I said earlier, the parents. And so if, if you get a student who says, well, I'm really not interested in being a doctor, but my parents really want me to mm -hmm. be a doctor, you're going to have to carefully handle that situation because you don't need your parents as enemies. And uh, because everything else you try to do is going to be received with that, uh, with that attitude. Okay, one final thing, and I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to encourage us to spend any time with it, but there was a question on how do I get my students to respect me? Well, we've kind of covered a lot of this stuff today, but let me just give you one quick answer, and uh, hopefully you'll get this emblazoned in your head. If you want your students to respect you, you must like and respect them first. You will be surprised how much leverage you will have with students if you show that you like them and respect them. Okay, so I think what now uh, we're going to offer, we have just a few minutes left. Uh, if any of you have any questions, either some, some subject that we've already covered today or one that we didn't cover that you'd like to ask a question about, uh, you've got three people here who hopefully will be able to respond to you. Uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you and let you ask your questions. But maybe you don't have any questions. Are we ready, Ray, to put in the survey link? Sure, let's okay. go ahead. All right, well, I'll put the survey in the chat. So make sure you fill that out. Um, this is how we this is how we uh, give out uh, the certificates. So we'd like to hear your feedback. We'd like to hear if you're interested in knowing more about Array Global. Um, so make sure you fill that out right away. It'll be posted on the chat in Zoom, and also for those that are participating on Facebook, because we have quite a few on Facebook, also some big groups too. So uh, big welcome to everyone. And I'm kind of surprised we have a we haven't had anyone. Uh, ask any questions, especially Farouz. He's usually like the first one that has like a rocket hand that can put his hand up. Ah, there he is. <laughs> Let's see. All right, Farouz, here you go. Thank you. Well, um, I was just waiting to, you know, be uh, gentlemanly to give a chance to to <laughs> others, but so uh, it's it's my turn again. So I'm I'm happy about it. Uh, Dr. Salam, thank you for uh, all the insights and valuable tips and lessons. It's always a pleasure to to get some uh, knowledge and, and and those advice from uh, the real professionals of, of the profession, which is why I'm I'm always one of those regular attendees of uh, monthly workshops by Eric Global. So uh, my question is pretty simple. Uh, and it's drawn from the uh, real practice. How do you engage students who've been overly dependent on their teachers? I had the same problem in China. I had the same problem in the Central Asian countries, where uh, it is deeply rooted in the mentality of the students that they depend uh, too often and and largely on their student uh, on their teachers. They are unable to, you know, uh, slip out of their comfort zone and do some work on on their uh, food. So that's a challenge. So I hope my question is clear. Thank you. Well, I I have a response, but I'll wait for my two friends to respond. But go ahead. well, I think um, thank you so much, uh, Faroz, and thank you for your question, which is a really really valuable question because culture makes a big difference. 
And we see that we see that here in the United States uh, with different groups of students that have different cultural backgrounds, where some are really eager and aggressive, and they were taught by their parents to be eager and aggressive and to demonstrate that. Whereas with others, they're very um, uh, they, they're very differential. They have a lot of deference and respect and regard for the teachers. So the question is. How do you create an environment that empowers them and gets them to, to think and behave in a different way? And I would say for teachers specifically, um, hold yourself back. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. So I'm currently, we, we created a leadership program. We have 15 students from all the area high schools here. And some of the students come from private schools and the majority come from public schools. And it was really clear to us from the beginning that the private school students are a lot more aggressive, uh, a lot more comfortable with themselves and their leadership. And some of the schools, especially from Hispanic, Latino, different cultures are very differential and they step back. So I have two teachers working with me. I am, I am not, uh, I have the two teachers, but when we started this program, we said to everybody, we're here as facilitators. We are not teachers. We're all going to teach each other. And my biggest challenge, I'll be honest with you, is getting these two teachers not to be teachers. Because when the students are hesitant, when the students hold back, when there is a difference in sort of dynamics in the class, the teachers want to jump in and make everybody feel good and everybody feel comfortable. And my response is, step back, let them handle it. So can you create an environment where the students believe that is their classroom, that they are partners? One of the things I wanted to mention earlier when we were talking about relationships and behavior is that we tend to focus a lot on control, that big C word, control, which is important. But what have we thought about it in terms of collaboration? Could students be in collaboration with you in that learning environment? Could you, um, you know, can we step back? Can we not be quick to engage? Can we let that silence in the room sit a little bit longer and see if they'll speak up? Or I like to use the Socratic method. I call on people. You know, I say, what do you think? You know, so I just think we have to, we have to think differently about the teaching part and allow ourselves to not be the traditional teachers and to give a little bit of the space to the students and give them, quite frankly, I call it, give them your power and trust that the outcome will be good. So yeah, I, I like that. Give them your power. I love that statement. Give them your power. Sometimes in my, my quick response to Farooz's question was uh, sometimes we need to, with that student who seems to be overly uh, dependent on the teacher and so forth. Sometimes we need to have, we need to give the power of that student and have the student do something and present something and have the student take a leadership role and say, hey, tomorrow, I want you to talk about whatever the subject is. So give the student the opportunity to take on leadership for himself, herself. Yeah. May, may I ask, may I make one more comment? Peruz, and you probably have tried this with your students. When I do a lot of facilitation with adults, I always say to them, let's, let's establish our ground rules. Let's come up with the rules that are gonna define, just like your classroom expectations. Um, I like to put myself on an equal footing with the students sometimes and say, this is our learning environment. Let's come up with the rules. And I think, I just think we have to demonstrate to them that it's safe. I honestly believe the key is safety. So students that are uncomfortable in having a different relationship with their teacher, can we create a safe space for them to trust that they've, if they behave differently and if they think differently and engage with you, the teacher, differently, that there will not be consequences? Because I grew up in a system similar to that. And your job is one of compliance, one of deference, and one of obedience. So I could never see myself 
as equal to my teacher. That would have been disrespectful. But I think we can create the space where you have respect and collaboration and honesty in the relationship. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't see any other hands raised. So uh, we're maybe going to pull this to a close. Uh, Dr. Jake, you want to give some information about upcoming workshops and and uh, any other thing that needs to happen here? Yeah, absolutely. It's summertime going to be starting here in a few weeks. So uh, we're going to be taking June and July like we normally do off. And so the next time you will see us is in August. Um, it's going to be August uh, August, August 19th. Uh, 19, so it's 19. Always the third Saturday of every month, you'll receive a um, you'll receive a newsletter on the 15th indicating. But please follow us on our Facebook page. Please follow us on our website, and we'll give you uh, plenty of information about what's going on. We are available throughout the summertime. We will be working with schools. We will be working tirelessly as we get uh, the school year set up. Um, for Ray Global and setting up our travel schedule, our workshops, and our academic contests, and just working with schools as they spend this time, this downtime in the summertime for their school improvement efforts. So we're excited about the summertime and be able to be able to uh, get things set up and organized and structured for this coming year. There was a hand, um, Dr. Jake, there was a yeah, hand. Uh, Reger. Abdul Rahman, my good friend, you can unmute yourself now. I know uh, he did post a question. It looks like he's not unmuting himself about uh, how do we get parents into the the school when they when they just don't want to be involved. I mean that was that was one of the questions. I think uh, Rekker, you did have a little bit earlier on. You're welcome to unmute yourself. Um, and and raise your hand. So I don't know, Doc. Oh, here he is. Go ahead. You're unmuted now. Hello. Mr. Yes. How are you? Jocko. Hello. I am fine. Uh, I'm very glad to see you under time, Mr. Jocko. Yes, you too. <laughs> you too, my friend. Thank, thank you. My question for Dr. Ray. Uh, uh, thank you for this workshop. We will all benefit our. Uh, like this workshop, I have just one question. Dr. Rai, you said the key is communication between the parent and the school. My question is, I, I also say the best or the key is communication between the parent and school. But in, in my country, in my school, I am a principal of high school. All the time I send the message to the parent to come to the school, uh, to see the, the, the result, the mark, uh, uh, everything, uh, uh, or what the student do in the school. But the, the parent of the student don't come to the school. In this situation, what I do? Uh, the parent of the student don't help us in, in the school. Don't come to the school to ask the, their children, this uh, the student. A lot of maybe 60 percentage. In this situation, what, what I do? Well, one suggestion uh, that I will make is that uh, number one, don't stop communications with the parents just because you don't think they're listening or cooperating. Find ways maybe to call them on the telephone and say, hey, you haven't responded and I'd really like to talk with you. I'd be, be happy to have a time uh, to meet with you and just talk about what's happening in classroom and uh, with your son or daughter. Uh, but uh, don't stop communicating even though they're not responding. And uh, there will be some, and it might be oh, a cultural thing. It might be because they say, well, hey, that's your job. Your job is to teach my son or daughter and my job is to be a parent. And they might have that. And except for the fact, except the fact that they might actually feel that way. But uh, I, I, I have to tell you that when I was high school principal, I, I had a few cases like this where no matter what I did, uh, I couldn't get the parents to respond. And it was very, uh, it was very, uh, very disheartening sometimes. And so sometimes I would, I would talk with a student and say, hey, I've been trying to get your parents to 
talk and is there something that I could do to get them involved more? So you might want to involve the student and say, hey, could you help us? Uh, could we do a phone conversation? Uh, could we do a Zoom call? Find other opportunities. And I, and I have to say too, that even with everything you try, you might not be successful with the parents, with everything you try. <laughs> However, mm -hmm. still treat the student with respect and pre just pretend that you have talked, uh, you know, that you've given this information to the parent, but don't punish the student because the parents are not cooperating. It's, it's a big issue. I've often said that, you know, one of the most difficult groups we have to deal with as principals, the parents, uh, they're, they're the most difficult, but that's, uh, that's the way life is. And we have to accept that. I don't know if that answered your question, uh, but yeah. I, that's only what I'm what I'm experienced with. Yeah, thank you, thank you for your doctor. Yeah, I get it, your point. Okay, you get thank it. you. That's <laughs> great. But the only thing I would add to that is the same thing, same discussion we had with students relative to memorizing. Um, ask the parents what would bring them into the school. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. we sometimes we really don't take that proactive step of saying to parents. We want you to be in the school, tell us. You could do it in the form of a survey, so it's anonymous. Or at the beginning of the year, if you have an open house, ask parents, what do you need from us to make the school a comfortable place for you to be? Because we know even here in the United States, um, we have a lot of parents that are afraid to come to school. They don't know how to engage with teachers. They don't know how to engage with administrators, they're afraid to come to the school. The other thing that some schools have done here is student-led conferences. And I don't know if any of you have done those or not. So when we have parent-teacher conferences, usually the teacher is the one who's talking with the parent. We flip that model a little bit. And now the students are actually giving a presentation to their parents with the teacher about what they're learning, how much they're learning, et cetera. So I just think part of it is creating ownership, as Dr. Ray said earlier, relative to the importance of parents, creating ownership that their kids learning is dependent on them and not just their teachers. Yeah, and you, you're singing my song. You're singing my song because I think uh, student parent teacher conferences. And the other thing, uh, Rugger, if I'm saying the name correctly, uh, the other thing I would think that would help to get parents there is like uh, one of the best uh, participations I had to get parents uh, was to do a science fair or demonstration of art projects. And if that child knows that that science uh, science experiment or whatever, or that artistic piece of work is going to be on display for everybody to see. Sometimes parents want to come say, oh, wow, my son, my daughter's work was seen by everyone. So sometimes that's the way, best way to get people in. And then you can say, hey, Mr. Mrs. So-and-so, I've met you before. I'm really happy to have your son or my your daughter in my class. And you can use that as an opportunity then to try to engage them. There's just a lot of tricks that you can try. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Doctor. Yeah, I got it, all of the point. Okay, I will do for the new year, inshallah. <laughs> Make that your goal for next year to get all of your parents, all of your students' parents somehow <laughs> somehow in communication with you. Inshallah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jacob. Thank you. Thank Jack you. Nice to see you Thank again. You. Nice to see you again. Sorry. Okay, Dr. Jake, did you have anything else? I think that's it, Dr. Ray. Thanks everyone for a wonderful year. And please keep in touch with us over the next two months as it's summertime and take some time for yourself to relax and to get rejuvenated for another great year. Great. So let me just leave you with two things to concentrate on and think about over this summer as you prepare for uh, next fall. The number one thing is education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Education is the most powerful weapon you can use. You know who said that? Nelson Mandela. Education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. And then I love this one, and I encourage you all to hold this in your hearts all summer. Teaching is the profession 
that creates all other professions. Teaching is the profession that creates all other professions. Bless you all for the work that you do. Thank you for being with us today. We look forward to seeing you in your fall. Heads up, be positive, be ready to come back in the fall and knock them dead. That's, that's a good old American phrase, knock them dead. Impress them with what you're doing. So great job. See you in the fall. Thank you. Bye, everyone.